This is the ninth message in a series on prophecy, and the third message in a small series from 1 Thessalonians 4. So if you have your Bibles, we'd like to read again this key passage, this cornerstone passage, referring to the coming of the Lord, beginning at verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep by Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. <clears throat> Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Last Wednesday night we were talking about those who are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord. One of the most thrilling aspects to me of this great truth we refer to as the rapture is that there will be a generation alive who remain under the coming of the Lord. The literal translation of this phrase from the Greek is survivor. And I discovered another one, the latter part of this week, that blesses my heart. One man said that the word could be translated the leftovers. And it's the first time in my life I ever really had any love for leftovers. <laughs> then we the leftovers. <laughs> I like that, don't you? Left over from what? Left over from death. Death has claimed the rest of the body, but some will be left over. Some will still be here when Jesus comes. Some will still be alive, for Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. All of us will be changed. The dead in Christ will rise first, and they will put away their corruption and be made incorruptible and set aside their mortality and be made immortal. But we who are alive and remain, the survivors, the leftovers, we are to be caught up to meet those who have been raised from the dead and there face to face to meet Jesus. And in that face to face encounter, when we see him as he really is, we shall be made like him. Made like him with that wonderful capacity that I refer to so often, to love him, as our heart wants to, to understand him as our heart needs to, to appreciate him as we sense that we do not now, to be able to comprehend him, to be able to enjoy him, to be able to embrace him and to hold him. This will be our first reaction, for it was the first reaction of those precious women in the garden that morning of resurrection when they saw him. How they longed to hold him, if it were only by the feet, for their joy was full. He was theirs and they were his. And so it will be in that hour, when the leftovers are cut up, and the dead in Christ shall have their bodies raised, and they shall be united again with those bodies now transformed, and together we shall meet Jesus in the air. Our text proper this morning, verse 16, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that's as far as we'll get this morning. First, let us concentrate on the first phrase, The Lord himself. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Capital L, little O-R-D tells us that this is in reference to Jesus. It is Jesus himself who shall descend 
from heaven with a shout. Someone asked me one time, an unsaved person, where is Jesus now? If he loved us so much, why did he run off and leave us, they said. Why doesn't he come to us? Where is he at this moment? Well, at this very moment while I'm preaching, Jesus is at the right hand of God's throne. He is no longer a spirit being, a pure spirit being as such. A part of the sacrifice of Calvary was that he be confined to a human body throughout eternity. He re-entered the glory in a state other than he left. He left a spirit, for God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. But the eternal God, God the Son came and in the incarnation of Bethlehem put upon himself the likeness of man apart from the nature of sin, wore that likeness of man for 33 years, laid it aside in physical death, descended into the pit in separation from God, and was raised from the dead to take that same body glorified again. This was the joy of the resurrection. This was what turned the disciples' sorrow into joy, is that they saw the same Jesus, the same Jesus they had witnessed in humiliation at Calvary, dying for their sins. But this same Jesus was glorified. The marks of the cross were in his hands and in his side and in his feet and in his brow. But he was changed. He was no longer bound by the three dimensions of man. Time, space, and matter no, help, no longer bound him, nor hindered his activity. He passed through locked doors as easily as they were open. He was everywhere present, and he said, Lo, I am with you even unto the end of the age. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. But the blessed truth of the resurrection was that this Lord Jesus, crucified in humiliation, delivered to the death of the cross for the sins of the world, was accepted by God, glorified with the glory that he had once before the foundation of the world. But this glory was then upon a human body. And this glorified man went back from the Mount of Olives to stand in the presence of God as our eternal righteousness. He took our standing at the cross. And now, because he took our standing at Calvary for our sins, he is now standing at the right hand of God for our righteousness. His presence there this morning guarantees that. And the fact that God has accepted him is proof positive that God has accepted all those who believe in Jesus. And this same Jesus was seen in the resurrection by nearly more than 500 brethren at once shown alive by many infallible proofs after his resurrection. They touched him and tasted of the food which he gave to them and handled him, heard him and saw him with their own eyes, and John testified and certified in his epistle that that eternal life was real. Now this same Jesus occupies the right hand of the Father's throne. He is there as the great high priest of heaven, after the order of Melchizedek with a never-ending priesthood, making an eternal intervention in our lives, that God might say to us that we will be saved to the uttermost because he ever lived to make that intervention. He is there in the presentation of his own precious blood on the mercy seat as an eternal propitiation for our sins. He is there representing us standing in that place for us until we are brought actually to that place to stand there in his merits for eternity. He is present in us by his Holy Spirit, but he is literally and bodily present at the right hand of God's throne. And from that place at the throne, he would descend. In the New Testament, there was just a hint in the parable which he gave to his disciples and he said that the householder one day would rise and shut to the door. And when the door was shut, this standing householder would come to receive his servant. There will be a day 
when Jesus rises from the right hand of the throne, where he is sitting, literally, until God makes his enemies to become his wife, footstool, one day he will rise in his coming in glory, bringing healing in his wings for Israel, but in the rapture, prior to that return in glory, to gather his bride in preparation for his reign upon earth and to deliver her from the wrath that shall come by the many plagues of God during the tribulation. The Lord himself will come. This same Lord Jesus will leave that literal place and come to another literal place referred to as the air. He will descend from heaven. Now, I don't know whether you have any comprehension of how far away heaven is, or exactly where it is, or what direction you'd start in if you wanted to go there. But the Bible does give some very clear statements on the location, the geographical location of heaven. Without going into a detailed explanation, the Old Testament writers said that heaven was beyond the stars. Job referred to it as being located in the empty places of the north. When Satan was upon his throne before he fell from his power and authority in the presence of God, he aspired to lift his throne into the sides of the north. So we have in the word of God the definite geographical location of heaven itself. It is in the north, it is beyond the stars. It is located by the empty places in the north, and astronomers tell me that there is such an empty place in the north where no stars or galaxies appear. And with our modern telescopes, we have now been able to probe some 500 million light years into space. They have discovered stars that far from Earth. And to reduce it to figures that maybe we can understand, it means that stars that have been discovered by our modern telescopes today are three followed by 21 ciphers miles from Earth. That's a long way, isn't it? And there are stars beyond that. And heaven lay yet beyond that, in the empty places where the stars stopped and eternity began. Heaven is a literal place, just as surely as earth is a literal place. God is there. His throne is there. The new Jerusalem, the city of God is there. Mount Zion is there. The tabernacle is there. The mercy seat is there. Jesus is there at the right hand. And his precious blood is there upon that mercy seat. And the spirits of just men are now there. The church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven, whose bodies have fallen asleep in the earth, are there. And the angels of God are there. And the seraphs and the cherubims are there. And the living creatures who cry, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, are there. And from that place, So far away, Jesus will come. Now, if that star that our telescopes have discovered were to travel toward Earth, it would take it 500 million years to get here at the speed of light. That's how far away it is. And Jesus is beyond that. And how long will it take him to come? In a moment, the twinkling of an hour. I'm glad I got straight on that because I always thought he was going to travel to the speed of light. And I don't think I can wait 500 million years, let alone 500 billion years. He will travel at the speed of thought. One second he will be in the Father's presence at the right hand, the next in the air surrounding this earth, shouting, accompanied by the voice of the archangel and by a trumpet, a trumpet which belongs to God. And when a trumpet sounds, and when that angel begins to talk, whatever it is he's going to say, and when Jesus shouts, the bodies of the living saints are going to rise. 
Remember, he said in John 5, the dead shall hear my voice, and they shall come forth. And the saints who are the leftovers will be caught up, the gleaming, gathered from the four corners of the field, which is the world. And in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, faster than the light refracts upon the eye, we will be changed, made immortal, incorruptible, glorified with the glory that is now upon Jesus as the proof positive that we will share it. United with him, carried away to his father's presence and presented with his father's name in our forehead as his beloved bride. What a day. What a moment. And it could be now. Oh, I can't get over the thought that Jesus himself is coming. I want him to come. Really, I don't care a whole lot about the angels. <laughs> I never did. I never could get hung up on angels. I mean, I know they're nice, and everybody ought to have one. And I do have one, and I'm grateful for the guardian angels that watch after the heirs of salvation. But somehow I know they won't mind if they hear me say this morning that I'm not nearly as interested in them as I am in Jesus. I know they won't mind because at their heart they long for the glory of Jesus. And they're glad when we love Jesus. I'm glad he doesn't send an angel, and I really, I'm glad he doesn't send Paul. I love Paul. He's my brother in the Lord, and I've had more fellowship with Paul than probably any brother in the body of Christ. But I don't particularly want to see him first. Nor Peter, nor James, nor John, nor Moses, nor Elijah, nor Enoch, nor Noah. And uh, it may take me a while to get adjusted for I even have anything much to say to Adam. There's a few things I'd like to say to him, but that matters. <laughs> but first of all, we're going to see Jesus. This is the hope of the church. And I'm sure that the Holy Spirit in this prophetic message puts this phrase first, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, because he wants the attention of of the bride focused on him. He is the attraction of this event. He is the star of this presentation. I'm not interested in the event of his coming. I'm not interested particularly in the trumpets, the angels, the accompanying events as much as I am interested in this fact that the rapture itself is composed of one thing, Jesus himself coming for his bride. We will see him, and after that nothing much will matter. For so shall we ever be with the Lord, and that sums up our eternity. Eternity is summed up by one statement, being with Jesus. <laughs> and I don't have a bit of problem in my mind even, let alone my heart in understanding what a wonderful eternity it will be by that one phrase alone, just be with Jesus. We will never fully plumb the depth of the love of Christ. We will never fully understand and comprehend the Lord Jesus himself. We will never fully be able to love him as really we are. All eternity will stretch out before us as one long, glorious day of a progressive revelation of the love of Christ and of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't use the illustrations that he uses without a purpose, and when he likens the relationship of the church to Jesus, as a relationship of a bride to a husband. He doesn't use just idle word pictures. And from the marriage on, if that marriage be what it ought to be, there is a progressive discovery of one another. And the love that brought you first together as man and wife grows deeper, stronger, sweeter as the days go by. How will it be then with Jesus? In the air, that wonderful consummation 
of all that we know now as salvation, wherein we have been betrothed to Christ as a virgin bride by the gospel. In that consummation of that marriage in the air, we will begin one long eternal honeymoon wherein there will be the progressive revelation of what we were and what he is. Say, you mean we're going to learn more about ourselves? Oh, I'm positive of that. Because everything is relative, you see, and the love of Christ is relative to the sinner's state. So that in the eternal state, we read in the book of Revelation, that the saints of God now glorified and clothed in linen fine and white and with hearts upon which they play and sing in the, in the accompaniment to the praises of God with palms of victory in their hands, with golden vessels that contain the fruit of their prayer. These saints now made like unto the Lord himself and conformed to the image of God's Son, are singing. And they're singing unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. A remembrance of sins, not by God, but by us, that the preciousness of the blood of Christ will never fade from our eternal view. And the wounds of the Lord Jesus will become more precious as time goes on. What a glorious day for in love, the love of Christ will be made known to us in a new and wonderful way. I'm glad the Lord himself is coming. I used to think maybe he just sent a policeman after. But he's our bridegroom. He's our beloved. He came all the way from earth or from heaven to Calvary to die for us. He went all the way from Calvary's cross to hell to save us. He went from the highest height to the deepest depth, from the uttermost truly to the guttermost. He went from the heights of glory to the pit of the damned. And he went from the most brilliant light, unapproachable and in no man could stand, to the outer darkness. He went from the sounds of rejoicing and praise, where there were weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. This Lord Jesus laid aside all that belonged to him by right. The insignia of his majesty, the eternal glory, a uh, glory of his deity. And sacrificed not his physical life, but his eternal life at Calvary that we might have it. And took upon himself our death and our ruin our damnation, our doom, and our hell, and our separation from God. The agony in Gethsemane and the tears that he shed, the weeping of Calvary and the broken heart, the sorrow and the grief that was upon him, all of it was his alone that he might experience that moment we talk about this morning. He might look at us, say that we are without spot, without blemish, without wrinkle, glorious, and a fit bride for himself, and so presenting us to himself, he will take us away to his Father's house to live. Now, if he did all of that to save us, he will not bear to trust the gathering of his bride to anyone but himself. But he will come for us. I wouldn't want anybody going after my bride. I wouldn't want any servant driving around peeping the horn and saying, uh, he says it's time to go now. I would want the bridegroom to come if I were a bride, weren't you? And every member of the body of Christ wants Jesus to come. And I emphasize to you again this morning that the rapture is not an event, it's a person. That the hope of the rapture is not the things that will follow, it's Jesus. That heaven is not the place, it's where Jesus is. And that the joy of heaven is not in the fulfillment of what we've always wanted to do, 
But the joy of heaven is being made one with Jesus. Will you remember that, that the rapture is Jesus? Now, you say, why do you keep saying it? Well, because Mary and Martha, for instance, Martha especially, didn't understand that the resurrection was a person. She thought it was a historical event. Somewhere out there in the coming day, there would be a resurrection day. So when Lazarus died, she wept and sorrowed at the tomb. And Mary did too. But Martha ran out to Jesus to tell him about it. And he said, your brother will rise again. She says, yes, I know. At the resurrection day, but... And he looked at her and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Man's dead, he'll live again. And if he lives and believes in me, he'll never die. Believe us, thou this. And that was a hint of the rapture right there. That the leftovers who live and believe in him would never die. And she said, oh, Lord, I believe that you're a son of God and the one who should come into the world. There is a difference between an event and a person, and the resurrection is a person. It's the Lord Jesus himself. When he comes, resurrection is himself. For when he shouts, the dead will rise. He doesn't come to bring a day. He doesn't come to set up an order. His presence himself will break the bands of death and cause the graves to open. The bodies of the sleeping saints will come forth, and not a force on earth, nor above the earth, nor beneath the earth, and cause the dead to remain in their place. He himself is the resurrection. He himself is the life. He will raise the dead. He will infuse them with life, and all because he is with them. And the rapture is not an event. The person, when he comes, all our hearts have longed for in Jesus will be satisfied. For we will see, and for the first time, we will know from experience what we know by faith. All that I need is in Jesus. Remember singing that? We'll learn that with our hearts and in the reality of it in that hour. We look upon him, nothing will be lacking. We see him and embracing, we will want for nothing. No absence will bring us sorrow, nor the presence of any other person will add to our joy. The rapture is Jesus. It will be joy unspeakable. It will be full of what? Glory. Glory for him and glory for us. And just one glimpse of him and glory. Will all the trials of life repay? That's the words of the song, but it's also the paraphrase of the word of scripture for i reckon that the sufferings of this present life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed to us and then paul in another place expressed that same word by saying that our afflictions bear only light and they're just for a moment and he said one day they will pass away be replaced by an eternal weight of glory what a day of glory, a day of glory for Jesus, and a day of glory for his Father, a day of glory for the Holy Spirit, who, like the faithful servant of Abraham, brought us to his beloved Isaac, and what a day of glory for us, who are the Rebecca of the day. The camel journey will be over, we will be in the arms of our beloved Isaac, he will take us into his Father's house, he will love us, we will be glad. Now notice, if you will, in this message, the accompanying sound. First, the shout. I assume, and if you don't like this interpretation, why well, you just get one that suits yourself, but I assume, and I feel that this assumption is correct, that the shout is the sound of the Lord Jesus' voice. Now, it doesn't really say that. It says, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And some have said it only means that there will be an accompanying shout, and I'm certain of that. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to shout when Jesus comes. And I'm sure that you're going to shout when Jesus comes. If you don't like shouting people, why, well, you better get used to it. Because somebody's going to shout when they see Jesus. 
Where do you think they're going to shout? I'll give you the exact words. They're going to shout. Oh, joy. <laughs> Remember at the resurrection? What did the woman say when she saw Jesus? Oh, joy. And she held him by the feet. But I'm assuming, and I think that assumption is correct, that the shout belongs to Jesus, because I'm sure he's going to shout. He has something to say. He's waited now some 2,000 years to make this shout. And the word shout itself is an interesting word, and we'll get to it in a moment. But what do you suppose that he's going to shout? Well, in the 10th chapter of John, where he sets forth the teaching of the shepherd and his sheep, he makes reference on numerous occasions to the familiarity, the intimacy between the shepherd and his sheep. He says he knows his sheep. And he says that he knows them by name. He calls them by name and he leads them out. This is his description of a good shepherd. A shepherd who knows his sheep by name. Who can just speak to them and they will follow him wherever he goes. And then he said in that one place in John 10 that there was coming a time when he said there would be one flock, not fold, one flock and one shepherd and he would gather them together and he would lead them out. And I'm sure that when he comes he's going to shout for his sheep. I heard a shepherd one time calling his sheep. <laughs> he wasn't calling them by name, so I don't know whether he was a good shepherd or not. He was just standing at the fence shouting, Here sheep is, here sheep is. And they were all coming. And even if Jesus couldn't think of my name and he said, Here sheep be, I'd come, wouldn't you? But he knows all of his sheep by name. He knows every one of you by name. Isn't that wonderful? He knows your name. He knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows all about you. He knows every desire of your heart this morning. He knows every fear. He knows every frustration. He knows every bruise, every skin blade that we've gotten along the way in this wilderness pasture. He sees us where we are, and now he comforts us with his rod and his staff. He anoints our head with oil. He does something to us. I don't know how he does it, but he makes our cups overflow from time to time. He leads us in the green pasture. He takes us beside still water. He makes us to lie down and rest in the heat of the day. He has watched us and nourished us and cherished us and loved us and cleansed us and sanctified us with the washing of water by the word. He has followed us all the way from Calvary thus far, and he will take us right on into his Father's house. This beloved shepherd is going to shout, and I just feel sure in my heart he's going to call his sheep by name says, with a shout, not with shout, I think it will be a single shout, and it will be the only time permissible when everybody will be entitled to their own interpretation, because at that particular moment, that shout will be interpreted by every sheep, and I'm positive I'm going to hear my name. What makes you sure of that? Well, first of all, my name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Do you believe that? And secondly, it says that the name of the church of the firstborn are written in heaven. That's where that Lamb's book is right now. It's in heaven, and there are names in it, and the names correspond to those who have been washed in the blood of Jesus. And since I have been washed in the blood of Jesus, I know my name is written there. And I know that when he calls the names of his sheep, he will call my name. I think it will be a single shout and every sheep will hear his own name. And, you know, they say, worldly-wise, that there's nothing that's pleasant to a man's ear as the sound of his own name. And in that day, that will be solemnly true. There is only one person that I can think of who could speak my name and fill me with joy, and that's Jesus. He speaks my name, and I'll follow him wherever he goes, and I'll be with him wherever he is. And that's what the rapture is all about in simplicity. Descend from heaven with a shout. Well, you said the word was interesting. What's interesting about it? Well, you trace the usage of this word in, for instance, profane literature of 
the time the Bible was written. I find three uses of this word. One, it is a word of command. It's the kind of a command an admiral gives, one writer says, when he commands the crew of his ship. So, if you have a nautical mind, not a naughty mind, but a nautical mind, you can imagine the admiral of this old ship Zion calling to the crew to weigh anchor and sail away. And we've been anchored, I believe, in this port long enough to suit me. This is about the worst shore leave I've ever had, and I'm ready to sail away wherever the admiral says go, aren't you? So. It will be a command of the admiral of a ship to his crew. And in another place, I find it was the command of a general to his army to move out. And as far as I'm concerned, we've been bivouacked long enough in this campground. I'm ready to pull stakes and move on. But the wonderful thing is, how would you like to have been in World War II and been like one poor fellow I knew in the Marines? who was overseas four years and eight months, and that makes me tired to even say it. How would you like to have been that poor fellow on the fourth year and the eighth month and the thirtieth day when the general said to him, the war is over, there is no more fighting, and you are going home. That's what it will be like to us. The battle has been hot and it's been heavy and it's been long and it's been hard. And we've been here in that battle. The battle is the Lord, but we are his soldiers. And it's been just a battle to keep from being entangled in the affairs of this life that we might please him who has called us to be a soldier, Paul writes to Timothy. It will greet our ears that shout like the sound of a general's voice saying to war-weary soldiers, the war is over peace of life we're going on. And third, I find this command used in another way, and I don't know what to make of it. <laughs> it's the shout of the charioteer to his horses. <laughs> and I don't know whether he shouts, get up, or hurry on, or get going, or just what he says, but it's the shout that driver gives to his horses when he spurs them on in the chariot race. And I think it may not be exactly a giddy-up. It may just be a world. It just may be the Lord saying the race is over. We've won. Now we're going home. Whatever that shout, our name, the shout of victory, that's what it is. The shout of triumph, the shout of joy, the shout release, long pent-up tension, long under pressure, long in anticipation of the coming of the Lord. What will it be like in that moment when suddenly it's all over? It will be a shout. You ever get under such pressure and such tension and such burden because of some circumstance and just suddenly have it be dissolved and you just felt like a shout? He just felt like shouting, what? Praise the Lord! Maybe that's what it'll be from us. From him, it may be like that shout in Revelation 4 when John in the Spirit saw heaven open and he heard a voice that said to him, Come up hither. And he was caught up in the Spirit in the presence of Jesus. To some it will be like the shout that Lazarus heard that day when he stood by the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth. And when Lazarus came forth, and we will come forth, that perfect command was the most joyful of all, loose him and let him go. Oh, I long for that moment when he will loose me and he will let me go. Do you want to be loose? Do you want to be let go? I want to be loose and I want to be let go. I want to be called forth from among the dead. I want to be caught up into heaven. I want to weigh anchor and sail away. I want to strike my tent and march home. I want to bring my horses into the stable 
knowing that the race is over. And best of all, I want to be carried upon the shepherd's shoulder to his father's house. And I want to be in the loving arms of my beloved bridegroom. Go away to the joys of that marriage feast of the Lamb, where God will see his eternal purposes in the cross fulfilled. And he will see the travail of his soul and he will be satisfied. And I guarantee if God will be satisfied, you're going to be satisfied. I'm going to be satisfied. So the Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. Now, his coming will also be accompanied by the voice of a great angel. The word here used to describe this angel means, first, in rank. If the angel bands were an army, he would be chief of staff or five-star general or something to that effect. For this angel is first in rank according to the Greek word used to describe it. Now there is much in the scripture about angels, and there are three distinct references to this mighty angel who is first in rank among the angels. Name. The name is given in Daniel, it's given in Revelation, and it's given in Jude. And his name is Michael. The name means, who is like unto God? And Michael, the chief of all the angels, is described in these three passages and referred to in this one. So we don't have too much evidence as to what this voice will say. Now, for a number of years, I tried to connect it with the Jewish nation because that's the most convenient. It says in the book of Daniel that he stands up for his people in that day. But that's during the tribulation. That has nothing to do with the rapture, which is before the tribulation. And in the book of Revelation, it says that Michael declares war on the devil. And I'm in favor of that war. Michael is going to declare war on the devil in the midst of the tribulation, and he will be deprived of the access he now has into the very presence of God to accuse the brethren. And because he is cast out of heaven and he comes down upon the earth, there is a great shout goes up to the inhabitants of the earth that says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for Satan has come down to the earth. And he knows he has but a short time, and his wrath is great. His wrath will be great. For it will not only be the time of God's wrath poured out upon earth during the tribulation, it will be the time of Satan's wrath poured out against God upon men. So Michael's going to have the privilege of declaring war and winning that war against Satan one day. And I want to tell you, you talk about a grudge fight when we get to that one. You talk about a grudge fight. Michael's been sharp in his sword for more than 6,000 years, and God only knows how many more, waiting for the day when the Lord will turn him loose on Michael, or on, on Satan. And he's going to run him clear out of heaven and run him clear down to earth, and it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of guys down here. They deserve him. They love him and worship him and follow him. I think they should have him, don't you? He's the God of this world. Let them have him. But there is another reference to Michael. It's in Jude 9. If you want to turn there, we'll read. Not the ninth chapter of Jude. The ninth verse of Jude. Listen to what it says. Yet Michael, the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, and he durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but he said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now here Jude mentions something that happened about which we have no more information. Clement, one of the early writers among the church fathers, said that he referred to an ancient piece of scripture called the Assumption of Moses, wherein the story is recorded of how God buried Moses, and no man to this day knows where his sepulcher is. And if Michael and Satan got into a fight or an argument over the body of Moses, 
in this ancient piece of writing, which I accept as the inspired word of God. Now, didn't that throw you? No, it's very simple. We have no copy of this article, The Assumption of Moses, but we do have Jude's reference to it. And if we believe that Jude wrote his epistle by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, then we must believe that the Holy Spirit would not have permitted Jude to refer to a lie. Jude wrote what he knew to be fact. And if the Holy Spirit inspired him, I accept it as fact that one time, sometime in the past, Michael and Satan had an argument and a dispute, and it was over the body of Moses. And so great was the power and dignity and majesty and authority of Satan that Michael himself was not allowed to rebuke him, but he called upon the Lord to rebuke him when he withstood this, uh, the Lord in the matter of Moses' body. Now, the writer of that little paper called The Assumption of Moses said that the story went like this. God commissioned Michael to bury the body of Moses in a place where no man could find his sepulcher, and when Michael tried to carry out that commission from the Lord, Satan opposed him. He disputed with him. He argued with him. And he said that God didn't have any power to take the Moses body away from him on two grounds. And listen to this. He said, first of all, Satan said, I, I am Lord of all matter so the body belongs to me. And secondly, he said, Moses is a murderer. And God's got no business messing with him anyway. Now that will enlighten you because in the book of Revelation, the devil is called the accuser of the brethren. And because he knows the brethren well, <laughs> their sins, past, present, and future, he feels he has just cause and legal grounds to accuse them before God. And because of the sins of the brethren, he also feels that he has grounds upon which he can claim their bodies in death. And this was before the cross, and Michael couldn't rebuke him. But he called upon the Lord to rebuke him. There are two words in the Greek for rebuke. One means to rebuke without any result. The person rebuked is never convicted of sin. And the reason he's never convicted of sin is one of two reasons. Either he is incorrigible and cannot be convicted of sin, or he is innocent. There's no sin in him. So therefore he's not convicted under the rebuke. The other word simply means to rebuke with results brings conviction of sin, repentance, and restoration. These are the two words in the original language for rebuke. Now, when Peter rebuked Jesus, he rebuked him with that kind that had absolutely no result. Not because Jesus was incorrigible, but because he was innocent. There was nothing to be rebuked for and nothing to be convicted of. So when Michael could not rebuke Satan, he called upon the Lord to rebuke him, and the Lord rebuked him without any results, whatever. Not because Satan was innocent, but because he was what? Incorrigible. And he could not be rebuked. So he paid no attention, not even to the Lord himself. I believe that the true meaning of the voice of the archangel is this, that when Jesus comes and shouts, and the dead in Christ rise first that the devil is going to try to keep those bodies in the grave. Two claims. He is the Lord of matter, he will say. Secondly, I know their sins and they got no business going to heaven. This time the Lord doesn't rebuke him. Michael himself will rebuke him. For the victory has already been won at the cross of Calvary. He will not call upon the Lord and say, I can't handle him, Lord. I'll tell you what he will do with Satan. 
he will say your power is broken forever. Grave has lost its victory and death has lost its sting. The power of the law is ended. Sin has buried itself in our blessed Lord. And the rebuke of Satan is Calvary. And he stands rebuked and Michael will stay his hand in that day. When he shouts everybody of every sleeping saint, wherever it is, all over the earth, will be gathered up into the presence of Jesus. And there in the very eyes of Satan and in the very atmosphere that he now reigns in, for he's prince of the power of the air. God will crush and finally crush that old serpent under our feet trample him beneath the feet of the saints. And the victory that we know now by faith will be ours in reality over Satan. He will have lost his last claim upon the believer, which is physical death. Oh, I can't wait for that. <laughs> Paul wrote in the end of one of his epistles, and he said that the Lord would bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Remember that? I'm in favor of that. That's going to happen when we go up. He is the prince of the power of the air, and when we go up through his domain, they're going to wipe their feet off. They're going to bruise him. And I'm going to give him an extra kick or two as we go by. I wouldn't even care if we were wearing spikes. And you know, come to think of it, I believe we will, because there the full armor of God has those sandals I told you about had the spikes in them. They were for standing. Maybe we'll just walk on them with spikes when we go on up. But the voice of the Lord and the voice of the archangel and with a trump, the trump of God. Now if you will compare the rapture passage in 1 Corinthians 15, you will see that this trump is referred to again. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye, the dead shall be raised incorruptible. For this mortal must put on immortality, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and so forth. It says it will happen at the, what? At the last trump. Now, because of this phrase, the last trump, and being so certain that this is the same trump referred to in 1 Thessalonians 4, people get the idea that this is going to happen in the tribulation or after the tribulation, because of the many trumpets that will sound during the tribulation. And a missionary was visiting with us several years ago from Australia. And he said he could never believe in the pre-tribulation rapture because of the last trump. And we spent an evening one time discovering what the last trump really was, and he went away converted uh, to a pre-tribulation rapture. For it does not say the last trump, period. It is the trump that belongs to God specifically. Now, the word last infers that there was a first. Well, there can't be a last without a first. You agree? When was the first trump of God? The first trump of God was in Exodus 19. Israel was camped at the base of the mount, Mount Horeb, and its name was changed that very day from Horeb to Sinai. Horeb means the mount of God, but Sinai means my thorn. And the mount had once belonged to God. His peculiar holy mount became the mount where also my thorn, my sin, was dealt with. The typical of Calvary. And the people later were camped about the base of the mountain, and God said to Moses, a type of Christ, he said to Moses, there's coming a certain time, and when that time comes, I'm going to call thee up in the mount, and you will bring the people with us. I want them to know that I've been speaking to you, and I want them to hear when I speak to you. And so the time came on the third day, and it was accompanied by thunder and lightning. The whole mountain began to tremble, and smoke began to 
cover the mountaintop, but out of the darkness of that smoke and the thunder and the lightning, there came this one sound. And it just kept waxing louder and louder and louder and louder. And it was the sound of a trumpet. And it was the trumpet of God. And it announced that he was coming down and the people were going up. And Moses, it says, called the people unto him. And they went up. That's the rapture. That's the first trump God blew. And the second trump will be at the rapture. And it is the last trumpet, God. Oh, there are trumpets throughout the tribulation. In fact, seven are given in the book of Revelation alone. The seven trumpet judgments, but they are angelic trumpets. Angels blow them. They have to do with judgment and they have to do with wrath. But the trumpet of God has to do with his people. And it has to do with the gathering of those people unto himself. Then it's impossible for us, perhaps, to really catch the significance of some of these phrases in our English New Testament because we don't understand what those people understood when they read it. The Roman army was everywhere. The whole land of Palestine, as well as the whole known world, was occupied by Rome. And a Roman garrison was a very, very familiar sight. And the sounds of those army posts were very familiar sounds. The people all knew the sounds that came from those places. And the sounds that were heard most often were the sounds of the military trumpets. And the Roman army had three trumpets. Three trumpet sounds, or bugle calls, if you will, please. The first one means to strike your tent. Strike your tent, that is, take it down, tear up camp, break up camp. At the sound of the second trump, line up. At the sound of the third trump and the last trump, march away. And here we are told it is the sound of the last trump that will usher in the rapture. Oh, dear brethren, we have already heard the Lord when he says, strike the tent. We heard that when we first believed the gospel. For the moment we became sinners saved by grace, we knew that earth was no longer our home, didn't we? And we knew that we were pilgrims and that we were strangers. And we knew that we could never settle down permanently in this life. And we knew that we could never camp here indefinitely. As soon as we heard that first call of the gospel and responded with hard faith in Jesus, we knew that from that moment on we were on the alert, right? Waiting for another trump. And it's kind of mixed up in my mind, so I won't try to straighten it out. But somehow I think of that second trump in connection with that day star that arises in our hearts prior to daybreak to inform us that the day of his coming is near. We're a generation of privileged people, brethren. And the Holy Spirit has, without dispute, witnessed in the hearts of the body of Christ everywhere on this earth this morning. Line up. The time is near. The coming of the Lord is at hand. Now is our redemption nearer than when we first believed. The saints of God are lined up and waiting, and we're on the alert. And at any moment, at any second, we'll hear that call. And when that trump sounds, it will mean one thing to us. March away. March away. We heard the song when the saints are still marching home. I want to be in that number. I don't say that. When the saints are still marching home, I'm going to be in that number. Are you going to be in that number? Say, I don't know. Does my son know whether he's in the army or not? <laughs> I imagine that if there's one thing he's certain of this morning, he's certain he's in the army. Supposing someone asks him, now if uh, the company commander comes out and orders your company out, are you going to know whether you're going to be in that number or not? He will say, I won't even have to think about it. I'm in that number. 
bad, bad, but I'm in that number. And when he says march, I march. And when he says go, I go. We're sorry that this message is incomplete, but due to the length of the original tape, the last few minutes of this message could not be recorded.